Good evening. Welcome to uh, our second Wednesday program for the month. Um, I'd like you to please uh, turn off any mobile devices you have. And um, I promise you that the heat is as high as we can get it, and it'll be nice and toasty right by the time we finish, probably. <laughs> My name is Sarah Rooker, and I'm the director of the Norwich Historical Society, and I welcome you here tonight. First Wednesdays is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council and is co-hosted by the Norwich Historical Society and the Norwich Public Library. First Wednesdays is supported statewide by the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, National Life Group Foundation, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services to the Vermont Department of Libraries. The Historical Society and the Library would also thank our generous supporters, the Boatwright Foundation, the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Mascoma Savings Bank, Norwich Square Property, and Jane W. Stetson and E. William Stetson III. I'd like to introduce to you James Maroney. He's an independent art dealer, organic dairy farmer, and farm advocate living in Vermont. He is past head of American paintings at both Christie's and Sotheby's, New York, and a graduate of Columbia University. James started his career at Sotheby's in 1967 when he became head of American Paintings from 1970 to 74. He opened his own private gallery, James Maroney, Inc., in 1977, selling American, fine American paintings to museums and private collectors. And from 1993 to 1996, he served as the head of American Paintings at Christie's. He also served a two-year term from 1976 to 78 on the IRS Art Advisory Panel in Washington, D.C. In 1986, James and his wife, Suki, moved to Vermont from New York City, buying Oliver Hill Farm in Leicester and transitioning literally overnight from art dealer in American Paintings on Friday to dairy milking 125 cows on Saturday. Congratulations on that. <laughs> Today, he continues to run James Maroney, Inc., and has been appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture and the Commissioner of Environmental Conservation to Vermont's Agricultural Working Group. Please join me in welcoming James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me all right? I don't, is, this, is this working? Yes. Did I hear a yes? yes? Is it any different like this? Hello, hello? That's better. What? Is good? Yeah. You can hear me? Okay, good. So thank you for coming on this uh, snowy evening. Actually, it wasn't too bad, was it? Could, could have been worse. Um, so t tonight, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to read you a couple of chapters from uh, a, a memoir that I've been writing. Um, and it, it's about a, a t it, it begins uh, in about 1967 when I, when I uh, got it into my head that I wanted to work at Sotheby's. Um, and uh, so we're, I'm just going to, to uh, read a couple of uh, uh, chapters from the book. And this is kind of like the second chapter. I left out the, the one that got me to Sotheby's. So, uh, I mean, I'll cover that. Um, and I'm, uh, if, if you can't hear me, would you just please raise your hand in the back if for some reason or other. I start to trail off because there's nothing more annoying than going to a talk where you can't hear. So um, good evening. You were about to waste a perfectly good hour listening to a few excerpts from my memoirs. But first, this disclaimer. Where I judge it unimportant that I offend, or where I recklessly gamble, that I'm on safe ground, I have used real names. Where those conditions do not apply, I have altered the names of certain persons to protect them from embarrassment and me from libel. Whether or not you are in a position to know one from the other, I advise you to regard this entire account as irresponsibly vague or laboriously fictional. In 1967, yet in my junior year at Columbia, I got it into my head that I wanted to work at Park Burnett Galleries, which in 1964, its English rival Sotheby's had just bought. So I made an appointment with Peregrine Pollen, the president of Park Burnett, who unbelievably agreed to see me, and even more unbelievably hired me to join Park Burnett's first trainee program, beginning that very autumn. Uh, I would receive $50 a week, $50 a week, for some left purposely unspecified duties and duration of time. 
I asked no questions. I shifted all my schoolwork to evening classes uh, and reported in September to 980 Madison Avenue. I do not know uh, even today what the Park Burnett training program was intended to accomplish, uh, nor what was expected of us, uh, all young men. Aside from inventing it, we never saw peregrine pollen again. In class that met, just, uh, that met each morning for an hour, we discussed not paintings or objets d'art, but prices brought for some fauteuil or silver gilt repoussé ewer. Uh, between times, we were all left to wander about on our own, as we were constantly advised to do, looking for a niche, whatever that was. I wasn't two months into the trainee program before I was assigned my first solo job. It is impossible to exaggerate what a callow, ignorant young scamp I was, and I don't know why they gave this important job to a 24-year-old who so obviously knew nothing of the world. Uh, perhaps no one else was available, or more, more likely, no one else wanted it. But Park Burnett had consigned Melvin Gutman's collection of Renaissance jewels, which had been on long-term loan to the Baltimore Museum of Art, and my job, as I but poorly understood it, was to take the train to Baltimore, pack it all up, and bring it back to New York. Fine, no problem. I had never been to Baltimore, a fact that unto itself was not really very important, except here was a frontier of sorts, offering uh, new vistas for the only straight wasp in the training program. On the appointed day, I went to Park Burnett's treasurer, I got a cash advance, bought a ticket, and boarded a train to Baltimore. I took along no credentials, no inventory, list, no paper, no pencils, no nothing. Uh, once there, I hopped the yellow cab to the rent-a-car, where I picked up a station wagon and drove to the leafy park, where, as in m many cities in those days, they kept that Sunday afternoon's diversion known as the museum. I was received, not greeted, uh, by an elderly man, probably 50, uh, who let me know in gestures and insinuations that he was displeased to be the one to have to deal with me and my mission. The Gutman collection of Renaissance jewels comprised over 400 odd-looking pendants, earrings, pins, brooches, pectorals, and chains, many with misshapen, dirty little white pearls and lusterless red and green stones hanging from them. There were reliquary crosses and ostrich egg cups uh, encrusted with musty I knew not what. The museum kept the whole lot screwed tightly into glass vignettes where the pieces had been on display for many, many years. For one whose entire expertise in jewelry had been gained gazing covetously at the bright glistening rocks locked because they were valuable inside the thick windows of Tiffany and Company, these things held no allure. Just one second. Uh, the, I don't know if I skipped. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, good. Sorry. The man gave me a dog-eared, typewritten list of generic titles, ring, brooch, necklace, but no numbers on it. A few hundred little soiled velvet upholstered boxes um, with broken fittings, a table and a chair, and he left me alone in a dim light to match up an item from the list, from the case, with an item on the list. Um, fine, I took off my coat and rolled up my sleeves. I had hoped to get this done quickly and go home. Uh, but it, was soon, it soon appeared that I, too, was going to get soiled, and that it was already mid-afternoon. Bother, I didn't know a pectoral from a reliquary. How should ignorance interfere? By five o'clock, I had checked off and packed everything I found and put it, whether it fit precisely or not, into one of the shabby little velvet boxes. Everything that is, but about 15 items that were not anywhere to be found. Close enough. I alerted the curator that I had accomplished my assignment. The old Dodger must have thought me a perfect idiot. I did not share his enthusiasm for thoroughness, and he said with palpable disdain that my rendition was unacceptable that everything on the list must be accounted for, and that everything was there in the vignette cases, everything. I would, I would, he said, have to pull the whole lot out and check it off again and get the manifest right. 
I had never before heard the vulgar expression to watch one's back, and I did not understand that in demanding a recount, he was protecting himself and his institution from a lawsuit. And we close at five, he said with a smug, self-important look on his face, knowing full well that 5.30 had already been accomplished. Vexed, I called the office. Tom Norton, who had been at Park Burnett for over 25 years before Sotheby's hauled into view, laughed heartily and said, I should take a hotel room, go to Baltimore Street for the evening, go to bed early, and start over in the morning. Baltimore Street was a famous neighborhood where, for the past two centuries, <laughs> sailors and longshoremen had spent their liberty cruising the bars for prostitutes or other salesmen and longshoremen, I don't know which. Barely 24 years of age and dressed as I was in my only Brooks Brothers suit, tasseled loafers and argyle socks, I went bravely into my first strip joint. A tall, thin, leggy blonde, waving a little American flag in each hand and wearing nothing but a garter and a white high-top roller skates decorated with red, white, and blue pom-poms, was dancing on the bar to Don McLean's classic, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. All around the bar, the men were seated at her feet, staring up lustfully at her, some stuffing dollar bills under her garter, where I suppose, because she had no pockets, she kept her money. She was a wonder. And then came eight or ten others, just as enchanting. I think I may have had more than a few beers. I did not get to bed early. Anyway, the next day, uh, I returned to the museum, and I unpacked and repacked the Gutman jewels, not once more, but twice more. I never did get the count right, still unable to match up five or so items with the list. Exhausted and annoyed, I boldly told the old man I had finally got it to come out. You were right. Persistence always pays off. What? I got his signature, and well after five, loaded it all into my rent -a wagon and drove away. I wasn't an hour along uh, on my journey when the previous night's indiscretions and the long, grueling day of museum work caught up with me. My judgment was not very well formed to, to begin with, but what judgment I possessed was now very clearly impaired. Afraid of nodding off and killing myself, I pulled off the turnpike somewhere north of Wilmington and went into the first motel I saw, locked the car doors, checked in, and went immediately to bed. I fell into the deep sleep enjoyed by those with clear consciences and never gave a thought to what was in my car, just a thin sheet of glass away from adventitious hands. The next day, I drove the rest of the way and delivered it all to the porters on the loading dock at 980 Madison Avenue, and I returned the car. The Melvin Gutman collection of Renaissance jewels, once sitting for eight hours unguarded in my car, parked at a motel beside an off-ramp of the New Jersey Turnpike, was offered in three or four sales over the course of the next few years. It brought $11 million, a sum which, had it been 11,000 and gone missing, would have materially altered the course of my life. <laughs> I don't think I got it about Sotheby's for many years, a company that then, as now, strives to inhabit the wafer-thin interstice between high-bred art and low-born commerce. Sotheby's people drape themselves in the mantle of scholarship, much as I am doing today, while at bottom they are no better than common merchants, who are, without a qualm, in the game for the money. Trouble is, since they don't articulate this point to themselves, and certainly not to their trainees, at day's end, there is actually not enough money in the drawer to offset what in pursuit of profit they have gaily squandered in pursuit of respectability. In those days, we Park Burnett employees did not so much go looking for property to sell as sit passively at our desks in order to deal as best we could with what came in over the transom. Collectors died and their executors simply boxed up the deceased furnishings and sent them to us to be sold. We published no estimates. Uh, we illustrated only every tenth picture, almost always in black and white. Much of what we wrote was fabricated. Uh, we had little of what is nowadays referred to as expertise. But in just this way did we offer two American masterpieces we never went looking for. One by Albert Bierstadt called The Emerald Pool, uh, a canvas six by ten feet, showing here. 
and John Singer Sargent's hauntingly strange portrait of the Pierron children. We bought in, which means failed to sell, both these pictures below $75,000, while today each would easily bring 10 million. Some others, like this fabulous masterpiece, also came in. But when I estimated, estimated it at 60 to 80,000, which was as high as I dared go, uh, the owners took it to Kennedy Galleries, where it was sold for double that. But prices were heading up. American paintings were just awakening from a half century long sleep, uh, and at times it seemed there was a wonderful discovery hidden under every stone. By 1974, the year I left Sotheby's, American Paintings with five employees had done $9 million, which made us, after Impressionist paintings and jewelry, the most profitable department in the company on either side of the Atlantic. The top price at that time was a mere $240,000, a tie between this painting by Yasuo Kuniyoshi called Little Joe with Cow, and Eastman Johnson's engraving copy of Emanuel Leutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware, about which more in a moment. It would be impossible to relate to you today the awe we all felt when two paintings of such disparate lineage as the ones I've just shown you achieved the same, almost unimaginably high value at auction. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometime in 1968, and freshly but insecurely ensconced in a corner of Park Burnett's little nine-person painting department, where I was put in charge of American paintings, my niche, I received a call from a man called Tom Piccosi, a second-generation Italian policeman who spoke in what in those days we insouciantly referred to as a working-class accent. Tom explained that his sister Louise had a collection of paintings and drawings photographs and sculpture by Thomas Aikens that she had inherited from her husband, Charles Bregler. Louise lived in what proper Philadelphians called South Philly. Tom said she was shy, which was why he was calling. He said she wanted to sell the, her collection, and if I would come down, he would introduce me to her. This was amazing news. There were in those days just a few names in the big canon of monumental American painters, names like Thomas Cole, Gilbert Stewart, George Caleb Bingham, Frederick Church, William Sidney Mount, Frederick Remington, and of course, Thomas Aikens, the biggest. I knew this, to be, to, I knew this was so because these were the names on the spines of the 20 or so books on, on, on Park Burnett then had on American art in its library. Among them was a full-length monograph on Aiken's work written in 1933 by Lloyd Goodrich, then curator of American paintings at the Whitney Museum. Goodrich had helpfully included a checklist of all known works and their locations, and the Bregler collection was among those listed. My research now completed, I made an appointment with Tom, and wearing my gray pinstripe Brooks Brothers suit, booked the train, uh, uh, booked a seat on the train to Philadelphia. So began a four years long association with Mary Louise Picosi, during which I learned considerable about Aikens, about the art business, and about myself. Charles Bregler, a student of Aikens, had come by his collection in somewhat irregular circumstances. After Aikens' death in 1916, his wife Susan and cousin Mary Adeline Williams inherited his estate. But because Aikens had had the temerity in the city of brotherly love to pose women in the nude in his studio, for which sin he had died in utter disgrace, his estate contained a large chunk of his life's work. World War I came and went, and then the Roaring Twenties, followed by the Depression. Everything sat during these decades in some cold, dark room somewhere. In 1938, but not before Philadelphians had entirely forgiven Aikens for his debauchery, Susan Aikens and Mary Williams bequeathed all of it to the Pennsylvania Museum of Art, now called the Philadelphia Museum of Art. When the museum curators had deigned to take what they regarded as not too far beneath their dignity, the executors graciously permitted Bregler to take what was left. What was left was over 50 oil studies, a roll of perspective drawings, hundreds of glass plate negatives, innumerable photographic prints, several plaster casts, ledgers, several boxes of letters, and a carved chair. 
Charles Bregler had lovingly restored and cared for these things for the remainder of his life. In 1958, he passed away. When I came on the scene, Mrs. Bregley was keeping all this property loosely wrapped in open boxes under the beds upstairs and on the cold, damp floor of her basement. Tom introduced us, and after we exchanged greetings, he excused himself and left Mary and me to get acquainted. I never saw him again. I got out my pencil, and my tape measure, and my yellow pad, and went down to the basement and made a complete inventory of it all, treating each box of photographs as one lot, purposely leaving the roll of prospective drawings bound up for fear that if I unrolled them, they might just disintegrate. I gave each lot a value, pulled pretty much out of thin air because we'd never sold an Aikens, and that done, I went back upstairs. When I first met the widow Bregler, uh, who was then about 55 by my reckoning, I found a pallid, cheerless woman who had obviously not had an opportunity to choose an easy path through life. She was myopic, asthmatic, ar arthritic, dyspeptic, illiterate, and overweight. She kept her thinning hair pulled back in a tight bun, and she wore her gray nylons rolled just above her stout calves. She wore thick glasses through which I suspect she saw little clearly and of which she understood less. She seemed always to have on the same Depression-era calico house dress, trimmed with uh, soiled lace and faded pink piping. She and her elderly mother, devout Catholics, lived together in a tidy but plainly decorated uh, row house in South Warnock Street. The black and white television was always on whenever I came to call and Mary Louise always offered me thin lemonade uh, served in a jelly glass with one ice cube. I came often over the next four years, perhaps as often as every three or four months. My job as a painting specialist was first to locate fine paintings and then convince their owners to consign them to their property to Park Burnett. Integral to my duties was, of course, to differentiate uh, authentic art from wrong art, that is to say, not authentic art to know what style and subjects were preferable in the market to others. Uh, this required some art history, which I was getting after a fashion at Columbia. But what one needed most was to know what it was worth. You don't get that in school. You get it on the job. The truth to tell, in 1969, I didn't have this skill yet, but I was working on it. I thought I was pretty smooth with Mrs. Bregler, who it seemed liked to talk but almost never about her Aikens collection that I had in 1968 estimated it to be worth about $500,000, a fabulous sum in those days, a number I had never even before pronounced, um, was not of much interest to her because she was not what I would later learn to call a willing seller. But I indulged her and she me uh, as we talked about the weather, about politics, about the church, about what was going on in the street at the moment, all sorts of things. Whenever I turned the subject of the conversation to art and money, she just as quickly turned it away. She wanted most of all to talk about diplomacy or the lack thereof amongst our politicians. She bemoaned their duplicity and unbridled corruption, uh, a situation which, without mentioning any of them in particular, she, she said she deplored. She said she wanted to start a school for true diplomats and that with God's help, she would do that someday. It seemed at times as if we were on separate tracks. She didn't seem to want to make any sort of connection between her altruistic ambition and want of money um, uh, it might take to realize it. And I wasn't much interested in philanthropy or God. But if provoked, she sometimes, un if, uh, if provoked by something ungodly I had unwittingly said, she crossed herself or fingered her rosary, always held tightly in her soft, fleshy hands. She referred regularly to God's will, and she gestured regularly toward Jesus, who, as God's agent, I presume she thought could dispense it from where he hung on a wooden crucifix over the mantelpiece above the vase stuffed with plastic delphiniums. During, during one visit, she told me a curious tale. She said she had woken one night and gotten out of bed and gone in her nightdress into the street uh, and walked alone as if in a dream, turning up this way and down that, knowing not where she was going. 
After she had gone in this way some several blocks, she found herself on the other side of town. She did not recognize the neighborhood. Then suddenly, as if beckoned, she came uh, to a big house in Walnut Street. She climbed the stoop, opened the door, and went upstairs. She felt her way along the dimly lighted hall, opened a door into a large bedroom, and found an old man sick in his bed. She cared for the man, fed him, and stayed with him. I don't remember giving much credence to this odd tale at the time, but after a year or two of going to South Warnock Street and getting nowhere, I decided to do a little investigating to see how Mrs. Bregler came by all this fabulous property. Accordingly, I went to the orphan's court and nonchalantly asked uh, the clerk to see Thomas Aiken's will and assorted other files pertinent to my inquiry. To my astonishment, he handed over Thomas Aiken's will to me, the original, along with Susan Aiken's and Charles Bregler's will. My pupils widened, I, my mouth went dry, my hands trembled. Aiken's will did not bear on the situation uh, at hand, nor did his wife's. So after reading them with all the awe one might have experienced if holding a 15th century book of hours, I returned them to the clerk. But Charles Bregler's will was another thing altogether, an odd thing, written in a shaky script. It read, I hereby bequeath my house on Walnut Street together with all my belongings, my stock, and all my collection of paintings and sculpture, spelled sculpture, to my beloved wife, Mary Louise Picozzi Bregler. The Orphan's Court files disgorged some other interesting papers and newspaper clippings, which the clerk invited me to read. Here is a, sum, a summation of what I learned. Mary Louise did not ever tell me when she had married Charles Bregler, and I, of course, had never thought to ask. But it seems that upon his death, in spite of being some 40 years his junior, and on the strength of having lived with him for nine years, Mary Louise claimed him as her common-law husband. I suddenly realized that it was Bregler who had been lying sick in that bed uh, in the house on Walnut Street. In court, Bregler's next of kin vigorously contested his will, charging that Bregler had never married Mary Louise Picozzi, that their union was preposterous, uh, that the will was either a blatant forgery or, if autograph, uh, most assuredly coerced, that as an educated man, a sculptor, a sculptor and a painter all his life, it was unbelievable that he could have misspelled sculpture. Nonetheless, on Mary Louise Picozzi's assertion that she was his common-law wife, the court, in its wisdom, divided the estate between her, uh, her and the man's rightful heirs. The latter got the negotiable stock and the house, at the time very far and away the most valuable assets in the estate, and Mary Louise Picozzi got the paintings and sculpture. That was in 1959, one year after Be Bregler's death. Now, roughly 10 years had uh, quietly passed. The heirs had apparently resigned themselves to this gross mis in, uh, injustice, and Mary Louise, it, said, it seemed, was also content with the status quo. But her brother Tom wanted his sister to sell, and as I could attest, Mary Louise was having none of it. 15 years after the court after the events chronicled here, I learned that Mary Louise Picozzi's mother had been Charles Bregler's char. Recalling Mary Louise's curious dream about wandering uh, in, uh, in, as if lost in Walnut Street, I now surmised that little Mary Louise, having gone there with her mother on occasion, or perhaps often, was probably familiar with the, with the Bregler house, that she was quite even possibly Bregler's child, not his wife. Since he was bedridden, bed, bedridden with the Pacozzi women regularly at his side, it would have indeed been possible for Tom, who realized that his family had stumbled onto a treasure trove, to coerce or forge the old man's will. Uh, once rested clear of the Bregler heirs, he could, as he had always done, mil manipulate his stupid sister uh, and into... Um, Uh, into selling. It was payback time for all the injustices she had suffered. 
uh, Tom's hand. She was finally feeling a little power, and she stubbornly refused to sign anything. She was happy to have things stand as they were. This was the picture of the situation that I conceived first from allegations leveled in 1959 by the family as I read them in the court papers and later stitched together in my young, overly feckoned mind. But I didn't know all this in 1972. What I did know was that I had spent countless hours over four years talking with a woman who had a fabulous, valuable collection and had thus far given me no indication that she was about to sign. And we were not getting any closer to this. I was stymied. I needed a new tact. On my way home one day, basking luxuriously in my sophomoric ignorance, I gaily surmised that Mary Louise's problem was that money, the kind we were talking about, was simply an abstraction to her, that she had never in her life seen a thousand, let alone 500,000, in one place. Uh, and I, so I never, I assure you, having ever seen such a sum either, hatched a plan to make money come alive for her. I asked an incredulous but intrigued Peregrine Pollen, president of Park Burnett, whom I had regularly informed of my progress, such as it were, on the Bregler case, if he would allow me to draw $50,000 in cash from a bank in Philadelphia so that I could show it to Mary Louise Bacosi, put it, so to speak, right under her nose. This, I told him, would quickly bring her around. Inclined himself toward the theatrical, he said he would do it. But with 10,000, not 50,000, he argued that if I were correct on the principle of the thing, then 10,000 should do the trick. I was less sure, but I reluctantly agreed. So on the appointed day, I went for the umpteenth time to Philadelphia, stopped first uptown, uh, strode into the Girard Bank, and presented a draft for $10,000 in cash. After counting it out in $100 bills, the bank teller unceremoniously pushed the sum under the bars to me. In hundreds, when separated into two stacks, uh, not above uh, an inch high apiece, 10,000 made an unprepossessingly dainty display. It might, I thought, look much more dramatic uh, if it had, were divided into singles with, say, a Franklin on the top of each pile. Accordingly, I asked the bemused teller uh, for the same sum in ones. I arranged my booty in 10 stacks and put them in my briefcase in three neat rows, stuffed some newspaper uh, uh, underneath so it would fill the case, and went with a glass half full kind of attitude, uh, a driver and two plain clothes cops whom our treasurer had hired, I presumed, to watch me as much as the $10,000, down to 2934 South Warnock Street. Mrs. Bregley was there as usual with her mother, watching an unctuous white-maned evangelist preacher on TV pound his lectern. It was hot, and according to custom, she offered me a small jelly, gar, a jelly glass with a thin lemonade and one little ice cube nearly melted. I made some light chatter, and then asked again if she wouldn't consign her property to Park Burnett. I asked again if she didn't want to convert it all into money uh, and, and then start a school for diplomats to give her money to the church, perhaps. The cynicism and opportunism that had crept into my breast in the few intervening years was really appalling. The two women who were not paying me much mind, they were fixated on the preacher. Nothing availed. The time had come. So gathering myself up for what I knew would have to be the final assault, I popped the question. Mrs. Bregler, I intoned sententiously, have you ever seen $50,000 in one place? I desperately hoped she wouldn't call my bluff and find me out, but 10,000 just didn't have the same mordant ring of 50,000. She paused to let the preacher on the TV make his present point, whatever it was, and then Heavens no, forbid, she said, imprecisely crossing herself and without looking away from the preacher. Her mother evidently didn't hear the question and so didn't cross herself, didn't divert her attention away from the TV and said nothing. Well, here it is, I announced importantly as I opened the case and spun it around in my lap, lifting it up toward them as I had so often seen the man who carried water for Jay Bears for Tipton do on the TV show, The Millionaire. Here it is. Mrs. Bregler and her mother glanced in my direction once distractedly and then again with a purpose, opened their eyes wide and dropped as one to their four knees. 
They both began to recite the rosary, crossing and recrossing themselves and furtively casting their eyes toward the wooden Jesus, hanging as if nothing had happened to disrupt his habitual solemnity just there on the flocked wallpaper above the mantel of the bricked up fireplace. Hail Mary, full of grace, is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. They each, in their own frantic pace, breathed beneath her breath, both feverishly mopping the summer sweat from their brows and waving me off as I tried to bring them back up onto the chintz-colored sofa. Out the window, I could see my two plain-clothes police escorts standing guard, one haranguing the other about something. My driver, looking unconcernedly up and down uh, the vacant street, was picking his teeth, leaning against the car, its motor running. I looked again at my victims, wondered, perhaps aloud, if they would survive this unprovoked assault on their respectability, and thought to myself I had done, uh, 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 I had done enough damage for the day. Unable to repeat, to, on repeated attempts to rouse either one of them, I closed the case and too hurriedly left them there in, the near, in a near faint, supplicating. I took the money back to the Girard Bank, where I was obliged to count it out twice, got a receipt, and never again returned to 2934 South Warnock Street. Fifteen years later, I happened again upon Frank Goodyear on the stoop of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Frank Goodyear was the director of the, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy, of which lately he had been named director. He told me that a few years back, the Academy had bought the Bregler collection and had presented Mrs. Bregler with a check for a million and a half dollars. He said last time he looked, she had yet to cash it. I was amused to read in the New York Times announcing in 1986 the acquisition by the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts of the Bregler Collection, which said that it was for 50 years, quote unquote, previously unseen, thought or rumored to be lost or destroyed, quite possibly fake, but in any case, largely uncatalogued even by Goodrich. South Warnock Street is not an agreeable part of town, but it is only a five minutes cab ride from Broad and Market Street. And Mary Louise Picozzi, for all her faults, was not, in my experience, the least bit unapproachable. True, she guarded the collection against numerous assaults, one of which from me until the very end. Yet Mary Louise Picozzi was a prophetically simple person with a maddeningly complex problem. My guess is that she elected all those years to sit out the check to sit on the check because, secondly, she could deny her brother any profit from his role in arranging it for her to own the tiger she had unwittingly taken by the tail, but primarily because, as a God-fearing soul, she did not want to spend an eternity in perdition, answering for whatever earthly pleasures accrued to her from its sale. In this, I believe she succeeded. The century that passed between Aiken's dismissal from the Pennsylvania Academy and the acquisition by the same of his studio scraps may tell us more about the lingering disquiet in Philadelphia surrounding Aiken's teaching methods, posing his female models in the nude, than about the supposedly cloistered woman who, by an accident of history, held what of its greatest artists the Pennsylvania Academy had been given but purposely left behind. Uh, I am, of course, chagrined at not getting the collection for sale, but I am just as pleased that the collection now resides where it should, and I hope that Mary Louise Picozzi Bregler rests just as easily with that denouement. So I can tell you one more if you have the, if you have the stomach for it. Uh, in 1970, the best collection of American paintings anywhere belonged to a man named Bill Middendorf. Bill had money. He either inherited or earned on Wall Street. I never did know which. Uh, it is, of course, a horrible generalization to say rich people seldom know anything about paintings. But Bill was different. He had an uncanny eye for quality and the confidence to trust his instincts and the money to back it up. These are the three essential qualities of a collector. His collection, purchased over a period of 25 years or so, mostly from the aforenamed Kennedy Galleries, included a marvelous harnet called the Social Club, and an easel-sized version of Emanuel Leutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware, which we saw earlier. Bill was assistant uh, secretary of the Navy under Richard Nixon, but he had just been given a new assignment as American ambassador to The Hague. And because he needed something to decorate his office in Holland, 
appropriate to his new station, Bill decided he would sell his American paintings and buy um, Dutch old masters. In fact, he had already bought a pair of Franz Hals portraits from Wildenstein and needed $900,000 to pay for them. David Nash, head of the painting department, and I took the train to Washington and we went immediately to the Pentagon to see Bill, who invited us into his office, uh, uh, a room about as big as a school cafeteria. Uh, we exchanged greetings. Bill explained that he arranged for us to visit the White House where his paintings were hanging on loan. They looked fabulous in the Oval Office and the West Wing. I made a list and tallied it all up over summer, uh, over supper rather, at a little bistro in Georgetown called C'est la Vie, uh, where the waitresses whizzed round in tight t-shirts, short shorts, and white high top roller skates. Everywhere I went, it seemed, the, the working girls wore white high top roller skates. Sadly, there wasn't going to be quite enough value on Bill's list to pay for his Hulse portraits, so I asked him to throw in a, a, rare, a few rare American historical prints and a Houdon bust of Washington I knew he also owned. Close enough. We sent him a check for 900000 and agreed to put the property up at auction and split 50-50 whatever the collection brought above that. A few days later, I was having lunch uh, with Pat Hills, then curator of 19th century American paintings at the Whitney Museum. Pat was organizing a retrospective for Eastman Johnson, uh, the first since Jack Bowers at the Brooklyn Museum 25 years before. Over the salad course, I happened to mention to Pat that we had Bill Mittendorf's American collection for sale. Pat's eyes widened. She explained that according to her research, Bill's version of Washington crossing the Delaware was not by Leutze, uh, but a copy painted by one of his young assistants, Eastman Johnson. As evidence, she cited a passage in the diary of Worthington Whitridge, a contemporary of Johnson's, who in 1850 was also a, stu a student in Leutze's Dusseldorf studio. Whitridge recorded in his diary that he and Johnson had just completed a reduced version of the composition to send to Goupil in Paris, where the lithographers would use it to make a print for sale by the American Art Union. According to Pat, and her opinion carried weight, Middendorf's picture was that copy. Leutz's large version at the, of the subject uh, is, at the, uh, is at the Metropolitan Museum. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's, uh, I don't know, it's uh, 30 feet long and 15 feet high. It, it's a centerpiece of the collection of American paintings at the at uh, the Metropolitan Museum. News of what Bill and I were up to traveled fast. A week later, I was in Phoenix to, to visit Reed Mullen, since the early 1920s, a Ford dealer, and a man whose collection of Western art was in my sights. I was out on the pool at my hotel sunning myself, enjoying a glass of Chardonnay, or, or when the hall porter, or whatever they called him, interrupted my repose to ask if I would take a telephone call from the White House. It was Clem Conger, Jackie O's holdover curator uh, of the White House and State Department collections. <coughs> Excuse me. Clem had heard that I had Bill's entire American painting collection for sale the collection that was hanging in the White House. But he said Mr. Nixon's friends would be very unhappy if Washington crossing the Delaware, iconic of, American in, uh, of America in its finest hour, were to suddenly leave the White House, especially now when the buses were lined up bumper to bumper all around its perimeter to keep out his enemies. Would I, he asked, take 200,000 and leave the picture where it now hangs in the Situation Room for the sake of the nation? Hmm. I had gone way out on a limb, estimating the picture at 100 to 150,000, double my estimate of its value as a mere loitzer. Peregrine Pollen and Peter Wilson, Sotheby's chairman in London, had shown faith in me by putting up the $900,000 guarantee. But they were nervous about American paintings in general and about my untested skills in particular. And even though this bid for the loitzer was uh, a justification, Clem didn't know that I had reattributed the picture to Eastman Johnson. I can't remember if I mentioned what a callow, ignorant young man I was, but in this case, I was supremely confident. I thanked him for his concern for the nation and haughtily declined. Besides, I didn't want to present the collection without its star. 
A week later, I got a call from Stuart Field and Clyde Newhouse, two prominent dealers, bidding me $150,000 for William Sidney Mount's loss and gain. Now, the same principle as that stated above for the Lloyds at Johnson applied also to the Mount. Always keep the stars of the collection for the auction. But I had estimated this picture to bring sixty dollars to $80,000. And not only was that far higher than any Mount had ever brought at auction, the opportunity to get back 18% of the guarantee without doing anything seemed really too rich to turn away. Not without noting the irony, but not without admitting regret, I sold loss and gain. I only later learned that Field and Newhouse sold it for double their cost to the Melville Trust, a foundation that, unbeknownst to me uh, at that time, bought everything they could get their hands on by William Sidney Mount and gave it to the museums at Stony Brook in Long Island, Mount's hometown. Even without the Mount, everything in the Middendorf auction went over estimates, and the collection brought a million six, giving us a profit after expenses of 300000 on the day. The Eastman Johnson of Washington Cross in the Delaware brought 240000 at the time a record price for any American painting. Uh, Peter Wilson called me himself from London to say jolly good. And that is my talk for the today. Yeah. <clears throat>